This might sound a little shocking, but over 80% of people who have sleep apnea have no idea that they actually have it. This means if you're watching this video, you could be an undiagnosed sufferer of sleep apnea. Hey everyone, Dr. Michael Bruce here. Now obstructive sleep apnea is kind of like what it sounds like. There's some sort of an obstruction that's blocking your airway. Apnea in and of itself is this repetitive inspiratory occlusion of the upper airway during sleep. That's a lot of fancy words for when you breathe in, everything seems to suck together and stop and close up your airway. What we're seeing now is roughly 15 to 20 million Americans have got sleep apnea. That is not a small number. A lot of people think apnea is a big person's disease, that you have to be obese or overweight to have apnea. I'm not gonna lie, it definitely makes your apnea worse, but I've got lots of patients who are not anywhere close to obesity or being overweight that structurally have sleep apnea. You can't just think, hey, I'm thin, I, I'm not gonna get something like this, or I'm heavy, I'm definitely gonna get something like this. What are the consequences of having sleep apnea? Well, usually it's an increase in five-year mortality, meaning within the next five years, you're gonna have a far greater likelihood of having something kill you. Also, the health consequences of undiagnosed obstructive sleep apnea almost always lead to hypertension or high blood pressure. There's a reason why, let me explain. So when you're breathing at night and you stop breathing, your heart rate slows down to conserve oxygen in the system because there's only a limited amount. Then at some point your brain says, oh crap, there's no more air, I need to breathe. And it speeds your heart up to wake you up to, <sighs> breathe in air. So your heart rate is slowing down, speeding up, slowing down and speeding up all night long. It's really not getting the rest that it's looking for. Those muscles and those tissues are not being able to kind of slow down a little bit. Of course, we don't want them to stop, but we certainly don't want them to be going very, very high and very, very low. This can also lead to an irregular heartbeat. Um, it can lead to something called pulmonary edema and even pulmonary hypertension. Aside from just those things, believe it or not, you can also get cardiac dysrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, even neurocognitive and behavioral deficits are gonna happen. And the biggest one that a lot of people just don't think about is if you have undiagnosed sleep apnea, you are at a far greater risk for a motor vehicle accident than almost anybody else. I'll tell you an interesting story. I was working with the GBI, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. I asked one of the fellows, I said, well, how do you know when you come up upon a car accident if somebody was a drunk driver or somebody fell asleep while they were driving. He said, that's easy, no skid marks. So what happens is, is when you're completely asleep, you never hit the brakes. You have much greater impact. Usually it's much, much more fatalities for people that are falling asleep behind the wheel. So once again, these are things that a lot of people don't think about, but at the end of the day, you're not only endangering yourself, but you could be endangering other people. Now, the thing to remember here is that sleep disorder breathing is does have, appear to have a significant relationship with cardiovascular disease. We know that if you're young with sleep apnea and it's undiagnosed, you have a greater likelihood of getting hypertension. With severe sleep disorder breathing, this is also, interestingly enough, is associated with something called right ventricular hypertrophy. So what does that mean? So remember the heart has two atrium, two ventricles. The right ventricle swells and gets bigger. Okay, now what happens when that happens? Well, if you have, uh, let's say, irregular muscle down here and regular muscle up there, one will push harder and the others will push normal and you will get an irregular heartbeat. When it becomes irregularly irregular, that becomes atrial fibrillation. And now you have a much bigger problem on your hands. Sleep disorder breathing is also highly associated with diabetes. Mild sleep disorder breathing turns out is associated with an increased odds ratio for elevating fasting glucose and two hour glucose tolerance. What does all that mean? It means that moderate to severe sleep disorder breathing is associated with insulin resistance. Your body really doesn't know what to do with the sugar and you end up with high blood sugar. When you end up with high blood sugar, it ends up going to fat, you end up gaining weight, and then you have a whole mismatch of your hormones going on. So again, there's all kinds of problems that we're gonna see associated with undiagnosed sleep apnea. Another biggie is metabolic syndrome. We also see a decrease in something called serum leptin levels. Leptin turns out to be the hormone that makes you feel full. So guess what? You have less feelings of full, so you end up eating more sugar, which just makes the whole situation worse. Now, what are the symptoms? Like how would you even know if you had sleep apnea? 
There's a ton of them, okay? So first of all, snoring is the number one symptom. And let's be fair, it's a two-way street between sleep apnea and snoring, but traffic is not equal on both sides. So what I can tell you is almost everybody with sleep apnea snores, but not everybody who snores has sleep apnea. So just because your bed partner snores doesn't necessarily mean that they have sleep apnea. Now, if you've heard them stop breathing in their sleep even one time, it's probably worth a sleep study because the truth of the matter is you're not noticing a lot of those times. So if you observe an apnea, that in and of itself is all you need to say, hey, I think you need to have a sleep study. Something else could be going on. Now, one of the most famous ones that I hear all the time is, doc, I snore so bad because I have a deviated septum. Well, remember, your septum is a piece of cartilage that runs right down the middle of your nose. Now, for most people, it's not particularly straight. And if it curves one way or curves the other way, it actually makes those columns of air more narrow, and that makes it more difficult to breathe. So if you do have something like rhinitis, which is a small inflammation of the nasal tissue, or nasal polyps, which are uh, larger, uh, actually, inflammations inside of your nose, um, or a deviated septum, all of those could make it very difficult to breathe through your nose and make the airway move air faster, which causes everything to suck in. And guess what? Now you've got an apneic event. One of the things that we see early in the morning when people wake up with sleep apnea is they have a dry mouth because they've been breathing through their nose and their mouth, waking up all night long. Oftentimes, they'll also awaken with a headache. This oftentimes has to do with the lowering of oxygen throughout the night. So very rare for you to wake up with dry mouth and a headache and not be somebody with sleep apnea. Night sweats, we really only see in menopausal women and uh, people with sleep apnea. So that's another biggie that you can start to look for. A few other things that I like to kind of look around. Are you fatigued? Are you tired? Do you wake up gasping for air? Do you fall asleep at stoplights? Irritability and depression is definitely something that we see in people with undiagnosed sleep apnea. Also something called nocturnal enuresis or going to the bathroom multiple times throughout the night. And uh, for many people, their libido can actually go down as well as have erectile dysfunction and impotence. The next question is, what do we do about this whole thing? Well, we used to just send you to the sleep lab and then we'd get the results back and be on our way. But now there are actually sleep tests that you can do at home. I'm a big fan of uh, sleep tests at home for a whole host of reasons, one of which is it's much more of a realistic environment of what you're really sleeping in. Because if you go to the lab, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but I'm going to attach 27 electrodes to you. I'm going to have two cameras facing you, and it's not going to be a whole lot of fun. But if you head on over to sleepdoctor.com, you can actually order a home sleep test, have it sent directly to your house, and the results are interpreted by a board-certified sleep physician, not me. We have a whole group of people, and that's what they do. And believe it or not, there's no need to visit a sleep lab. You just send it to your house. You wear it for a night. It, the information goes into your phone. It zooms back up. Two days later, you're meeting with the doctor, and now you know exactly what's going on. I strongly encourage you to get tested, even if you're not completely sure. Why? Because look, if you've got it and we figure it out, it can change the course of your life. But remember, sleep apnea is probably one of the most common sleep disorders out there. The good news is it's also one of the most treatable and the treatment can definitely be life-changing. This is Dr. Michael Bruce, The Sleep Doctor, wishing you sweet dreams.